So this is a round two. Uh, again, we are going to do our best to sum it up in two minutes-ish each because I want us to finish up because I've got a couple of closing remarks I'd like to make. Um, so this is our setup for round two. Thank you everyone so much for this. I'm representing the statistics table, which was surprisingly full, um, pleasantly surprisingly full. And uh, we first started off that we didn't love statistics, except for one person at the table who admitted to hating them. Um, our conversation was pretty wide ranging um, about what we look at, what matters, and how we feel sometimes, especially around ebooks, that um, just number of circs. It's a bit limiting because if you only have a limited number of copies for something, that limits how many times it might circ in, uh, in total. Um, and then sort of thinking about our collections as a whole, right now there is a bit of a plateau for ebook circulation. We're sort of over the last couple of years, um, for many of us, we feel not included here because I know your circs are just through the roof uh, as you pour more money onto the pile, um, <laughs> is that we are sort of seeing a plateau and why is that? Could we be seeing more? I went with the um, opinion that we could probably see up to 10% of our collection being, uh, circulation being ebook circ with the right amount of curation, money, etc. Uh, et um, and thinking about things like wanting reports like which uh, items circ zero times, and that might help with weeding of the digital collections. And I guess those are actually really, really good. Uh, <laughs> I just want to, what we did sort of talk about at the end, which is sort of a call to everyone who represents the library here, is that the province does collect a ton of stats annually, puts them in this beautiful spreadsheet that goes year by year that you can compare so many things. Are there things that are missing from that gigantic spreadsheet that we might like to see um, in there? We sort of discussed, we'd love to see um, sort of a library sort of genre based, what percentage of your say e-collection is children's material versus nonfiction versus you know, romance. Um, and looking at that, that'd be fun. Um, also, um, breaking out um, video, circu digital video circulation um, in the provincial stats as more libraries go into that, and um, trying to somehow compare uh, circulation across pricing models. And um, you know, do we see that you know the eighty-five dollar books are really good investments over five years, or are, is it the twenty-six books over twelve months? And, um, just met, uh, generally got a feeling that we should be doing more analysis of our e-collections and really getting in there and digging through um, all those numbers to find out how they're being used. So. Our table was the accessibility table in the back and we started the session by going through and just saying what brought you to this table and that was a really good starting point because we found out that two of us came from the perspective of we're looking at accessibility of how do we serve people with print and perceptual disabilities or other kind of accessible disability type features. And two of us came thinking, how do we make things so that people can access the content and find it? So our conversation throughout the, throughout the time that we had veered both on the sort of what we, what we refer to amongst our table as the accessibility piece versus the findability and usability piece. And so we kept going back and forth and having the different discussions. And we, the final, the net result, the, the final talking point is if we work towards really good accessibility, then the usability will become better just as a result of that. So we had talked about how, like how, how do we actually get people to find our, our content and e-resources so that they can use it. How we talked about Hoopla and some specifics of the usability and, and findability of Hoopla content and how you can access content that's not available for your library or not in Canada. The, the point was made that in some, temp, in some cases res with respect to findability, we say, well, it's actually not available in Canada. The, the idea that we're kind of, in general, the population is getting used to the fact that there's some content that's just available in the state, so that's not necessarily specifically the issue. But if we say, hey, here's our library, come and get this content, oh yeah, not for you then that's an issue. So figuring out how we can balance that piece. We talked about the accessibility with who, from the accessibility issues of Hoopla in terms of do they have descriptive video and the idea of descriptive video for people with print and perceptual disabilities being able to access this content. 
and the, just the example of Netflix launching Daredevil about a blind character and not having a scripted video. <laughs> on the video. So it's not just a hoopla or a library issue, but just an accessibility and advocacy issue. We talked about accessibility then in a much broader and bigger sense with respect to how it, how it impacts libraries. Um, we were talking about better connectivity, so of the movie examples that I gave earlier, two of them are not accessible in most of BC because they don't have enough bandwidth to be able to stream the movies. So whereas Hoopla, you can at least download it, but again, you have to be able to have the, the, the good bandwidth. And it, that, that's actually a key accessibility issue. And what prestige libraries would have if we could say, all public libraries have access to fabulous, fabulous internet access. We talked about economic account, uh, economic accessibility for people who are coming to our patrons. Our patrons who come to us with a tablet, by definition, have a different sense of accessibility and in terms of the economic sense than the homeless patrons who just don't have access to it. And even if we're offering lending programs to patrons in that respect. We talked about meeting the needs of our home library services patrons, that's the term that we use at our library, our talking books patrons, and that we offer a level of concierge service to them with respect to our physical collection, and what would that look like in terms of helping patrons with parental perceptual disabilities with accessing content on their own devices, that, that's our licensed content, um, and what role does, do libraries play in advocating for these kinds of things. So working with the vendors to say, well, if the patron has a particular patron type or P-type that, that will, you, will, will overdrive, let, can we work with overdrive to say, if they have a certain P-type, can you extend the loan period because we know that these patrons need the longer loan period? So what role do libraries have with advocacy? But better, better accessibility means better, better usability for everybody. Lending Programs Group. Um, so we had a representation, um, good representation from the North Shore uh, and Surrey and also Port Safety. Uh, so um, some breath. Uh, we talked, we talked a little bit about the kinds of things that some of us have done or are doing or might do. So we're all in sort of different places when it comes to devices. Um, I think um, what what we all have seen, those of us who've been lending devices, was. Um, that the early day, any devices we were loaning that were really just about um, kind of a, an introduction to the form factor and the experience, um, that that initial uh, borrowing spike that we saw has pretty much resolved itself and the, that use for these types of materials um, is falling away. Um, where uh, device lending is still successful seems to be where there's a really clear purpose that has been defined for the use of that program. So in some organizations, it might be around digital divide um, and, and providing um, some additional access. We talked about um, how we liked the BPL's idea of the sort of made in BC, um, uh, kind of bringing it together that way. Um, in West Van, we, our sort of Kindle learning program, which sort of started as one thing, has morphed into genre-based Kindles, and that's definitely been a second life, and we've used that to really um, feature our reader's advisory capacity and, and, and introduce people to new authors. Um, you know, other reasons why one might lend uh, devices would be around featuring more digital content, um, or summer reading for uh, kids and teens. Um, also, um, in, uh, in our more northern library, um, making space on the shelf. So if you need to create space, can you, you know, if you want to maintain the entire list of a particularly prolific author, such as the kind who die and keep on going. Um, <laughs> can you, you know, take the first 20 or 30 volumes and, and put them into some sort of digital, you know, make them available through a digital device so that the current ones that are really the majority of the CERC are on the shelf and then the older ones are still available. So an interesting idea, right? How do you use it just to manage um, limited space in your physical facility, especially if you're trying to make more, people, more room for people? Uh, in terms of Barriers to device lending, the two that um, came up, one was just around funding, you know, how do you pay for these things and then how do you maintain them on an ongoing basis? Uh, they're neither fish nor fowl a bit, um, the cost of those programs. And I believe in wrap up signal. <laughs> there. <laughs>
privacy group about halfway through, so I'm going to give a summary of the second half because no one else wanted to talk, and then you guys can jump in if you want to. Uh, but the point at which I came in, we started talking about the education piece around privacy, and a couple of libraries, um, BPL has just, I'm sorry, which library are you from? North Van City. So North Van City is about to debut a uh, privacy course, a digital privacy course for patrons. We've just redone our digital tattoo course here into digital internet safety and talking more about those kind of risks and rewards with things like sharing your information in one way or another, location services, staying logged into Google, all that kind of stuff. Um, but we haven't turned that on ourselves as much. And so another piece we talked about was how to share uh, information about the terms and conditions around databases and other electronic resources that the library provides and making sure that's transparent to users. And uh, Toronto has a page on their library website that lists all of their databases and gives a direct link to the privacy uh, sort of policy language. So how can we incorporate that into our existing digital awareness guide and other things that the libraries as well? Um, talking about privacy as part of the brand of libraries and something that we can offer, not just education and advocacy around, but maybe also tools. Um, we talked a little about the responsibility of individual libraries versus the responsibility of our larger regional and national and international bodies <laughs> in our professions and the, the desire for our membership dollars to be going towards this kind of work on a larger level. Um, and we ended with a really uh, like exciting but fraught conversation about the idea of, so we've seen libraries lend out internet access. And so the idea came up of um, lending out something like a VPN, allowing people to, from home, get the same kind of protection in terms of their data that they get if they're accessing the internet through the library. Which, of course, would bring with it all kinds of problems, but it's a really exciting idea as well. Um, something I want to talk about more, for sure. Does anyone want to add anything? I think <laughs> one of the first ones was um, just the note that it can take years for you to negotiate with vendors to get the kind of privacy at a level that you want um, and that's acceptable. So it's not easy. <laughs> it's not. Thank you. <laughs> Um, just like every li other library, I'm sure we're all trying really, really hard to market our e-resources and how to do it. So there's some great ideas that people are already doing. One of them, um, for example, from Whistler, they um, did a whole big campaign where they got Linda, Kubler, and Press Display all together. So on the same, they, so they have done a lot of marketing on like something big is coming. That's like their theme. And so it was like you know, there's posters, there's banners, there's like you know, social media everywhere, and then they introduce all services that way to get people to think about libraries. Um, not being the obsolete or the libraries being what they think libraries are about. And of course then later on we come up with some other themes like we'll change um, from Spanish, I think, um, when they market to the business uh, chamber of commerce about what libraries are and try to introduce them to the different um, business resources that they have, online resources that they have at the library. And then of course Jennifer came up with like, you have no idea that should be out of here. <laughs> you know, like when you try to talk to people about libraries again. Um, so we talk about um, like uh, different libraries. Um, you know, we try all the things that we normally do: your press display, your 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 website banners, your social media. You know, um, West Bend has like little Starbucks, like sort of like Starbucks app of the day, app of the week kind of cards to introduce people to like consumer reports or um, any kind of e-resources. And we all try to figure out like. Does any of those convert to real use? Like, how do we, you know, measure that, and, and what is effective? Because a lot of libraries are struggling with, like, well, we did all these things, but we're not really sure, like, you know, some, you know, what, what the uptick is, and when it's hard to tell. Um, and so we're thinking then we talk about, like, well, maybe the interlink, maybe co-op, you know, could do something all together. So as libraries, we all market our services together. And of course, the challenge of that would be just like, um, you know, when Whistler like, introduced Linda, um, somebody from Squamish is like, hey, I heard about that, you guys have Linda. And they're like, no, we don't, you know. And so same with like, you know, our Tri-Cities, you know, when, when you know, like, if somebody come in and to Port Moody and say like, do you have pronounce it? And we'd be like, no, you have to go to Coquitlam. And of course, then there's the residency issue, right? You know, like, not everybody, um, People are used to being able to come in and borrow a book, you know, with a Westman card, and they can go anywhere to do that. But that's not the case for electronic you know, resources. So how do we market as a whole to make sure that you know, like, we're sending messages that libraries are beyond books, but also at the same time, not run into those troubles. It's like, well, they come in, get really excited, and they're like, oh no, we don't have that. No, we don't have that. You know, and so that's just make it tricky. Um, and then one of the other things that we talk about, I think, would be most important for um, advocacy. Um, 
on my marketing is staff awareness. How, how much time do we spend on making sure that you know staff know the resources so that when somebody comes up and say, um, you know, I'm looking for a book to learn Russian, the first thing you say to them is like, hey, did you know about our language learning um, tool online? Rather than right away directing them to the books. So that's something that you know, we try to get people to do. I realize we're already five minutes over, but I just want to take a couple minutes to say some thank yous. So at first, I want to uh, thank the co-op, of course, for food and energy and uh, helping us put this together every year. So let's give a big round of applause to Ben. And BPL for giving us the space to hang out here this morning um, and get everything done. Thank you, Vancouver. Oh. It's nice and central, easy to get here through transit. Um, and also, uh, thank you to all of you for coming here, sharing your ideas, everyone who came up and um, talked at the front of the room. I really appreciate it. It makes it so that we do show off all of our different ideas and perspectives and help us build a community of practice um, in the province of BC. And um, by recording it today, uh, those who weren't able to make it for a number of reasons will be able to learn everything that we did. If you took notes, please add them to this doc um, at the top of the screen. Um, that would be wonderful. If you aren't able to do it yourself, pass on your notes to someone else who can, and we'll make sure that can be shared around. Uh, there are lots of great ideas, lots of great discussions starting. If you um, want to, there'll be at the LBFG group, which talks about a lot of database and ebook issues all the time. Um, meets actually next Thursday at uh, 2 o'clock in the co-op office, which is just up the street. Um, if you don't have a login to the um, co-op, just email Lori, um, sitting over there. Talk to Lori, and we can make sure that you have access to our minutes um, for the meetings, as well as the invites that go out. Um, we meet about every other month. Um, and it's very fun, lots of discussion around such issues as accessibility and statistics and databases and all that fun stuff. So thank you so much for coming today and uh, oh, oh and yes Vancouver has offered to give anyone who hasn't seen the Inspiration Lab a tour. So after I'm finished speaking, find Sam or, and, Jonathan. or Jonathan and they will tour you through the Inspiration Lab. I just want to talk about logistics for this afternoon. Okay, logistics for this afternoon. Um, anyone who's coming to this afternoon session which starts at 2 um, it's at the co-op space, um, and what other logistics did you want to say? Uh, eighth floor, 605 Robson. 605 Robson, yes, yeah, so if you signed up. There'll be bagels. There will be bagels. <laughs> there are so many bagels. We will be eating bagels. Um, and before we go. Eight bagels. Yes. Thank you, Sarah.